When someone asks me how to get a design job, I always say that the first step is to have a portfolio with two to three detailed case studies. Let me tell you a secret. When I was starting out six years back, I had only one case study. Well, that works too if the one that you have is insanely good and detailed, but mine wasn't even detailed and far from being good. So what did the case study have that got me my first design job? Let me take you through that on the other side of this jingle. Stay tuned. Hey you awesome people, welcome to my channel, this is Sapta and if you are here for the first time, this is the place where I help designers build and scale their career with tips, suggestions and tutorials. If you're into it, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. My first case study was a mock application. Now what's a mock application? A mock app or project is a thing that doesn't exist and will also probably never get built. It's something that you think in your mind may be a digital solution to a problem that you're facing and then you work towards it and design as if it was real. And then when you write about it, it essentially becomes a case study for a mock project. It's a very common thing amongst beginners since they wouldn't have any real work to show. My mock project was, wait for it, a bill splitting app. Now you might be thinking, what's new about a bill splitting app? Splitwise has been there since long. Right, but mine was a bill splitting app which did a few things that Splitwise couldn't, at least in 2015. Six years back, I was in my first job right out of college and I would go out with my friends and colleagues very often. For the expenses, one or two of us would pay and later we would split it amongst ourselves. We did use Splitwise, it's a great app. Our workflow would mostly be like this. We would uh, first discuss on WhatsApp, trying to remember who paid where and how much. You know the stuff like, who paid for the petrol? Ah, you did. Uh, you and I paid for the tea and so on, the regular stuff. After that, we would put those details on Splitwise, which would calculate and tell us our splits. And then we would transfer the money using net banking or cash payment. You see, to do a simple thing like splitting a bill, we had to jump between three different apps in quick successions. That was the problem I attempted to solve. Well, it wasn't me alone. Me and two of my friends from work, Jaydeep and Mohan, together conceptualized this. Since I was the one with the knack of design, I naturally took it up. It was a chat-based bill splitting app and it did three simple things. Number one, it could create group chats. Number two, it could add and calculate expenses. And number three, you could even pay and receive the settlement money in the app itself. Simple. We named our app Split App because it was an app that could split. Well, let me show it to you. This is how my case study started. Yes, with the logo, one big picture of the logo. Yep, I designed the logo too. Uh, I don't quite remember why I made it this way. I'm sure I had a good enough reason back then. I also put the logo on a mock-up of a business card and I chose to keep that as the header. No title, no problem statement, nothing at all. Then I again chose to show the logo in a few other stationery out there, followed by the login screen. Well, there are some obvious questions which comes to my mind these days, like why should India and plus 91 be in two different fields? Don't they mean the same thing? Anyways, going back to what it was, I remember I had spent one whole day trying to find this phone mockups. You know, this mockups are nothing but this Photoshop files where you can just double click and upload your design and it'll feel as if they're showing up on a mobile device. So yeah, the login screen and this was the home screen. It would show all the group chats out here, the different expenses that you had occurred, and it would show you a summary of what you're supposed to get and what you're supposed to pay to your friends. And of course, an option to add a new group chat or new expenses. Again, a zoomed in version of the same. And after everything, I just created this one more line of description about that particular screen. You know, that's about it. There was an option to send reminders as well. And uh, here was the chat screen pretty similar to WhatsApp, Telegram or any other chat apps that you see these days. Well, now if I see, it feels like an accessibility nightmare because these font sizes are extremely small and when you actually preview them on a mobile device, they will feel very, very small and the colors also do not have enough contrast which are comfortable to the eyes. I don't think I ever previewed this design on a mobile device. I simply designed and uploaded it. Yep, and this is how you could pay as well. 
And this is the only place where I had put how it would look when you pay, haven't delved deep into it in the case study at all. And then again, a summary page, and this is how you add an expense, you know, include me, equal split, unequal split. That's it. That's how it started and ended. No problem statement, no details, no backstory, no processes, just a few pictures of screens with one line descriptions. This approach is great for in-person presentation slides where you would be speaking and explaining things along with what you show. But a case study is mostly read while you are not present in person. So what you write must do all the talking. Because if you haven't written something, it'll be assumed that you haven't thought about it at all. Just like if you do not like and subscribe to my channel, I will assume that you don't like the videos I make. You know, 63% of you haven't subscribed to my channel yet. If you think I'm adding value with all these videos, a sub to the channel would be incredible. Coming back to my case study, what I thought was I would explain all the details when they call me for an interview. But that's not how it works. I didn't realize that if they don't find the case study convincing, they may never call me for an interview and I may never get a chance to explain the details. Some of you might be thinking, what details are needed here? It's pretty obvious. Today, many of these things are very obvious. Today, making payments over WhatsApp is standard. Back then, none of these was possible. Remember, UPI as a technology didn't exist. The only way to send money over the internet was to use internet banking. That would need you to log in. And when you attempt to log in, it would prompt you to change your password for security reasons. Then you would need to enter the account details and IFSC code to add a new beneficiary. Then it would take a couple of hours to get it approved. And only after that, you could transfer money. Well, that's how internet banking is even today. Nothing much has changed. Wallets like Paytm were there, but only a handful of power users would use them. They were no way as popular as they are today or what they have become after the demonetization in India in 2016. To the wallets, people would often question, why would I transfer money from my bank account to another account just to pay using a new app? I can always use internet banking. Those were the technical limitations and that's how many people thought in 2015. If you look at it again, I actually presented a futuristic solution to an existing problem which everyone could relate to. It wasn't so futuristic that it felt right out of a sci-fi movie, it was relatable. I thought like this, if I can attach and send an image via chat, if I can send the link of a video over chat, why should I not be able to send money? These are nothing but a set of instructions, a set of encrypted instructions which tell the system what to do and when. When this is tapped, play the video from YouTube. When an image is selected, show a preview in the chat. If this, then do that. I try to use that quite literally here. If someone selects a recipient, enters an amount and enters the password, transfer the money. <laughs> if this, then do that. This was unique about my solution, which very few people probably had thought about at that point of time. This showed that I could think beyond the limits of possibility. This was the USP or unique selling proposition of my product and my own self. I should have ideally written in detail about it, delved deep into the entire experience around payment. But I didn't. I treated it just like any other feature. Instead, I concentrated more on how I present my screen. I showed phone mockups and whatnot. I even did a tiny bit of branding exercise where I showed how the logo would look on a letterhead pad, eraser, and other stationery. All those things are not needed in a UX case study. While doing all these things which mattered less, I ended up diluting the most important part of it, which was the payment over chat. Today, I'm able to articulate all these thoughts and justify some of the decisions I had made but back then, I didn't, or maybe I couldn't. The things and details that I'm speaking in this video, if I had written all these things down, it would have made a much better case study. Well, in spite of all this, I got selected for the interview. I got selected for the job as well, but the case study was not the only thing that contributed to that. I had to perform in the interview and the exercises that they had given me. But either way, this not so good case study got me an interview. Of course, no one told me how, but I can think of two possible reasons how that might have happened. Number one, they saw the potential in the idea. They might have seen that I could think clearly using first principles and propose a solution that was futuristic yet seemingly achievable. 
even though I had not explicitly written about that in detail. Number two could be, back in 2015, there were relatively fewer people, at least in India, who would apply for design roles. It wasn't a cool profession, you see. So maybe companies would speak to almost everyone who had at least a moderately convincing portfolio. These days, there are lots and lots of applicants and hence companies are forced to raise their bars when it comes to shortlisting portfolio. So that portfolio of mine will not get you a shortlist in 2021, simply because there are many people who have a way better ones. Now, in my case study, even though I had not written down all the details, I had actually thought about all of them. I had thought about and planned all the details and cases very meticulously. I knew in and out of the problem. I had a lot of talking points and this helped me a lot during the in-person interviews. Any question that my interviewers asked me, I could answer them well because I had already thought about them. I had a lot of talking points and which worked in my favor. Today, after going through this six-year-old case study, I almost thought of publishing it, you know, which was lying on my drafts for the past many years, just for the sake of nostalgia. But then I held myself back because I feel I may end up misguiding someone who hasn't watched this video. Some things are better off in the draft, you see. So that was my first case study the one that got me my first design job, and how your case study should not be. I hope you learned something new in this one. If you did, please hit the like and subscribe. This is Sapta. See you all in the next one.